Here we are, state of the school. Um, so thank you. I'm sure people will be filtering in. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here and just to hear a little bit about how the school is right now, but really the, the crux of this evening is to gather your insights and your thoughts and your feelings, actually, about our early stages of our strategic planning. And Tricia Stone is here from our Board of Trustees who's running the Strategic Planning Committee and a lot of other wonderful, amazing um, trustees as well. But I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa to do a little bit of Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, I wanted to introduce myself. Teresa Sampayan is a PA president for this year. I have an alum, Andrew, 2009, and Zachary, who is a senior. And I wanted to also introduce the members of the PAEC, the executive committee. I see Miranda right there, our secretary, Beth, VP of Inclusion. I know Sandy um, and Montrella, VP of Engagement. Is there anybody that I had missed? And I want to thank Miranda and Christina for being the professionals tonight. So thank you so much. And I'm sure President like Lisa Kearns cannot be here tonight. Also, so tonight, as Eric had said, he is going to um, give you a highlights of the year recap. And together with Trisha Stone and the Strategic Planning Committee, they will start to um, introduce um, the process of what they've done and then ask for feedback and insight. <coughs> Excuse me. So I also want to thank the Strategic Planning Committee. We have um, Randy Barnett. Is Nancy here? Oh, hi, Nancy. Um, Eric, of course. Uh, Tanisha Williams. And then Jack Chin on our Board of Trustees. Are you here? There you go. Kim Drew. Thank you. There you are. Um, Lucinda. Thank you very much. Lee Katz. Will Madison. And um, Seema Mitra. Here. Thank you so much. And Trisha Still. So they'll be leading us tonight. So, Oh, not as true. Oh, sorry. And the Board of Trustees. I'm so sorry, Mika. So thank you, everybody, for coming out. I'm going to hand it over to Eric. And have a great evening. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Teresa, can we give a round of applause? Just have such a wonderful job this year with the PA. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little fast um, because I only have 20 minutes with you. Um, so uh, we will. I'll try to talk fast enough so we have a little bit of time for questions at the end. But please know, any questions that you want to follow up with me, either send me an email, give a phone call, stop by the office. I'm happy to engage on any questions that you might have. So here's what we're going to do today. Um, and I'm just going to start with some KPIs, right? Key performance indicators, just to. Um, affirm that the school is doing incredibly well um, in so many different ways. So um, I want to give you a little admission update and Crystal Ogletree, our new director of admission, is way in the back there and she has just kicked it out of the ballpark. No, um, hit it out of the ballpark. <laughs> well, maybe in soccer you did. Uh, but um, as you can tell, our admission at the school is very, very strong. It remains really strong. You'll see that the asterisk is when we went to one-to-one -to -one admission. So we basically only offer the number of spots we have. So um, because our yield has been so high. So you'll see that our apps are a little bit um, down, about 7% this year. That actually is ubiquitous across all the independent schools that we've talked with. Everybody is a little bit down this year. Um, it, it's a demographic piece. Um, on school-age children. It's also, it's mainly down in our public school applications, and you'll see that probably has a lot to do with cost. Right? So that is one of the things we're gonna be talking about in our street teacher um, um, Just tremendous interest, and before we move, I really wanna thank um, Latara and Mike, and every parent, many of you in this room, who helped with open houses this year. Um, it's just amazing how welcoming um, everybody is and how um, when people come to visit they just really love the school and we'll see how good our new window system holds up <laughs> um, enrollment I want to give you a sense of where we're headed in enrollment so this year we're at 515 you'll see that we're targeting 528 students for an ultimate enrollment of 550 students so we are growing this school over the next few years um, um, so we'll add 13 next year. We're also 
we're realizing now the power of the economy of scale. So we'll be able to bring in what we predict seven more flex students. Really important. You'll also see that as part of the strategic plan. So what you'll see is a lot of the KPIs I'm sharing are directly tied to what we'll be talking about in this in the, in in our thinking for the future. So that's why I picked these slides, if that makes sense. Um, so we'll have, a, we think, 189 flex students out of that. 529 is about 60, uh, about 36.8% of the school for an average award of 69%. Um, so, um, so, you know, um, when you look at our benchmark, the school continues to be a leader in access. Um, and it's something very, very important for the school. So we'll talk more about that. Um, development, I didn't put in this year's numbers because we're not done, but Nancy and her team are doing a great job. Yeah. Sorry, Eric, on the first slide. Yes. 69% the average award for the 36.8? Yes, okay. yes, exactly, right, right. Um, so um, we continue to garner really great financial support um, through the annual fund through the school, and this is so important. So you'll see we hit a record in the last four years for the number of people who are supporting the school. Great parent participation. This was a goal for so long. And <laughs> alumni at 10%, Neewa is just been so great. And we're working really hard to get the alumni engaged. And you have to engage them before you can ask them for money, even though we still ask them for money. I should say you have to engage them for they'll give you money. Uh, but this is actually um, right up there with the average nationally for independent day schools. So we're not bad at this. We're just fighting uh, sort of a culture of people moving on and not returning to get to their schools. Um, we've really targeted leadership gifts, and we've done a really great job of um, really asking people who can to support the school in meaningful ways. Um, so um, that's great. I want to give you a little sense of where we are um, compared to our peer schools as far as our tuition goes. So Lick remains in the third quartile. That's where we've sat for quite a while. Um, you can see what, what really the most important thing is, is there's not a lot of difference between these schools. So we don't want to be the most expensive school for sure, but um, we feel pretty comfortable in, in this position. Uh, so I just wanted to, um, last year we did a 4.5% increase in tuition. The average for our benchmark group was 4.8. You'll see that one school actually lowered their tuition. There are some schools out there experimenting with that. Not necessarily successfully, I'll say. It doesn't translate into more interest in your school, um, which is an interesting uh, relationship. Um, so here's another way to look at that. You can see where we are in this continuum here. What you will note is the peninsula tends to be more expensive, the East Bay tends to be less expensive, and the city tends to be in the middle. Um, the other thing I really want to talk about, and this will come up in our, as you'll see in our discussion, is the um, amazing longevity and experience of our faculty at the school. So of our 60 faculty members, you can see that 21 of them have 21 or more years of teaching experience. So that's really exciting. These are pros. However, it's also proposed it's a challenge in the future as teachers start to retire, right? Um, and then you, what happens, especially in the Bay Area, is how do you attract talent? We're gonna ask all of you to help us think this through. How do you attract talent to a very expensive housing market and cost of living, right, for an industry that pays, you know, not as well as perhaps tech um, or other choices that some of these really, really smart, bright people have. Um, and so, this is coming down the road for us as a school. We're really lucky to have this amazing, amazing faculty, but in 10 years, it's going to look differently from what it looks now. So, yeah. so these next few slides I'm going to preface before I show them to you, and the trustees haven't even seen these. These are from a marketing, uh, a metro area marketing study that a lot of you participated in at the very beginning of the year, conducted by the National Association 
of Independent Schools and the California Association of Independent Schools. The data is fairly fresh for all of us. Crystal and I actually have an appointment with NAIS next week, I believe it is, Crystal, to dig deeper into the data because some of it we don't understand. So, um, and I'll explain that to you. So it's really, I just want to show some of what information we're gathering about our market position, if that makes sense. Um, but please take all of this with a little bit of a grain, grain of salt. So. Um, that's a really fun slide. <laughs> um, so what's really exciting is for us is that our parents at the school, all of you who took this survey at the beginning of the year, are um, rating Nick Wolverding higher than parents in other schools are rating their schools. Does that make sense? So the level of around um, academic standard, like all of these categories. Right? And then, um, I'm sorry, sorry, wrong. This is the current parent benchmark. So these are current parents in peer schools. These are our parents. And green means it's a statistically significant um, difference between those two peer groups. Does that make sense? So 98% think we have a solid reputation. Parents in other schools think 94% on average. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so this one is all parents including, so you can see the sample, the number is quite large. These are random samples of parents with kids, not only in private schools, but also in public and parochial schools. So how they are, are looking at their school. So, and that makes sense, right? Because hopefully, if you're going to an independent school, you have a higher level of satisfaction than maybe if you're going to a different type of school. Does that make sense? I'm not going to talk about this because this is a weird category. Okay, I'll, I'll just explain it. <laughs> so because we go, I have one-to-one -one admissions, we, our prospective parent pool were people that we denied for admissions because we had nobody that we took who didn't come. Well, we have a very small number of kids. So we said, okay, let's send it out to all these people and find out what they thought about us. They're, some of them are very upset. Um, and so um, that's, this is the data that we need to dig into more deeply to understand it, because it doesn't correlate to the experience that other people are having, right? So these are prospective parents out in the world. These are our prospective parents, basically parents of people. And you can see the return. We gave four years of data, um, four years of people we didn't take, which is, or three years, right, Crystal? Three years, which is, it was a lot of people, right? Like a thousand people? Maybe? More like 3,000. Right. Yeah. But only like between 92 and 163 returned it. So we have to understand this. So, so don't look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, because it's, I was, I was really upset. I was like, why? But then we started digging into it and we realized there's some bias in there. Um, but the piece that I think is important for us is is here right in that our current parents are highly highly satisfied with the experience that they're um, having at the school for their children right and even higher than parents at other benchmark schools does that make sense i'll let you just digest that this one you know I have no stake in this one, but this one is <laughs> so, um, so A is this column. So it's this column is significantly, statistically significantly higher than this column. And then this column, is, it, C is, D is higher than this. Yeah. yeah. We sent it to everybody, I think, right? Yeah. It's only like half. Yeah, which is actually um, our our parent body had a higher rate of return also than a lot of other schools. Uh, so almost half of our parent body returned their surveys. So that was good. Yeah. Um, so we're still digging through this data. They, they also did a lot of research on price sensitivity, which is really interesting, and it's, gonna, it's very much connected to the strategic plan. Yeah. Can you talk about the 
do just to restate or re ask what you said about column A, that's more than the list of schools you showed us on the tuition list. Right? Exactly. Yes. Because it's a broader set. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Um, so they did a lot of research around price sensitivity um, and how much is too much for an independent school education. And that's another piece that um, Crystal and I need to dig into deeper to really understand the data before we start sharing that widely. But um, you know, as you'll see when you um, get into your focus group feedback, um, price is a real concern for, for independent schools. Um, so we, we need to work on that. Um, so those are just some facts and figures. Um, and I only have five more minutes. <laughs> Sorry. I could share so much, but I wanted to also just touch on some really great highlights from the school this year. Um, so we moved into our building October 15th. Um, the best part of the building for me is how much the students love it. Um, literally, it, it was a seamless move-in for them. Um, the faculty are also really, really happy. So thank you to everybody who helped to make that happen. Um, the breakout spaces are used all day, every day, with different groups of kids. The labs are really quite um, beautiful and, and are um, conducive to great work. Honestly, the views, the air, and the light in the building. Um, somebody just came back to the school, is that Peter? Um, and said he was an alum and said, I didn't realize how depressing that building was until I came to this building. So, um, and then, um, just great teaching spaces. The gallery space, I, my office is right there, so I get to watch people interact with the student work in the gallery. It's beautiful to watch just how like, people are so excited about what they see. Um, one person came in and said, is this a museum? <laughs> so, um, so it's just enlivened that whole corner of Ocean Avenue. So that's been really exciting. Um, we've got a seven year term of accreditation from CAIS. If you remember last year, we had our self-study and we had our visit. They were incredibly impressed with what the school is doing, which is great. Um, and so now we're working on their recommendations, which are rolled into the thinking of the strategic plan as well. Um, I talked about the uh, Metro study. We won a state championship. <laughs> The boys came in second, but you know, <laughs> second. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, it was just, it's really, really exciting. Just um, a dream of um, Jeff Gardner's for years to take that trophy home, so that was really cool. Um, we had our first ever hyphen hat, and that was organized completely by students. We're, they already have a team in place to do one next year. Um, I didn't even, this is embarrassing, but I didn't even know what a hackathon was. I thought a hackathon was like kids causing trouble by hacking into other people. <laughs> so I learned a lot. Does everybody, do people know what it is? Okay. Well, a hackathon is when you actually are presented with a problem and you create program to try to solve that problem. So it's actually it's a very good thing to do. <laughs> um, and the kids were amazing. Really excited. 137 kids. Adam was really involved in that. Um, yeah, it was 24 hours, yeah, yeah. And I made them, I said, you have to do it on a training weekend so you get enough sleep to come back to sleep. <laughs> so, um, yeah? Um, it wasn't clear, it's there from all over the Bay Area, just as, as far away as, uh, you know, I don't know, Salinas or Modesto, yeah, very far, and, and I didn't realize that when, when people were talking about it. Yeah. 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 And Paul was, yeah, a lot of parents volunteered. Paul, uh, and also the kids got amazing sponsorships from um, companies. They were giving away prizes left and right. It was, it was really impressive. And they raised enough money to, to pay for the whole thing. Um, and it was also, they really targeted kids who didn't necessarily have access to that opportunity in other venues. So it was very lit, like, it was really great. Um, we got a grant actually to launch our first free summer um, art program here at the school for neighborhood kids this summer, which is really exciting. And AIM High, if you guys know, it's a 30-year program that works with middle school students. They have, I think, 14 campuses now. Lick was the original campus three years ago. They're going to be back on our campus this summer. I'm really excited about that. Beauty and the Beast is coming up. 
um, 60 kids are in this thing, which is so exciting, um, really good. People love the fall play as well. Um, and then Oracle, if you haven't been, this is your chance, because they're going to the Chase Center, and we have no idea what it's going to cost for us to go there. Um, we also, University and Lick are exploring um, giving um, a venue to other sport teams and not just basketball for these types of events. And also a, a joint service project between Uni and Lick before the game. We have to do a little bit more to combine, to, to make our schools a, a little less um, competitively toxic. <laughs> and a little bit, and, and actually we're not, because a lot of the kids know each other. But we really want to actually leverage their friendships a little bit more, so, um, so we're working on that. Now, um, maybe we'll end up at the Chase Center, but right now the plans are not to. So that's just, um, so really, okay, so strategic planning. Um, here's last year's, uh, last, uh, uh, our last strategic plan. I'm gonna take you to the website, um, but before I do that, you can read all about it on that website, but um, I just wanna talk a little bit about what strategic planning is for Lick Learning, because lots of institutions use it in different ways. So for Lick, it's an opportunity to create a shared understanding of the school's priorities for the next five years. It's also a way to focus our resources. Um, so, um, you know, things cost money, so this enables us to say, this is what we're gonna focus on. This is what we're gonna spend our time and money on. And then it's an iteration, hopefully, of our core values, who we are as a school. It deepens our commitment to our mission. Some people see strategic planning as highly visionary and 20 years out. That's not the way we work on our strategic plan here. So I wanted to make sure that we had that shared understanding. I love this quote. Um, Jack would probably really like this, that planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now, right? Um, because we don't know what we're educating kids for in the future. It's amazing how quickly the world is, is moving. So we want to make sure we're bringing some of the needed skills into the present so our students are ready for, for the future. So, um, so with that, I'm going to show you the website, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tricia. And maybe we can have time for three questions. Are there any questions at this point? Awesome, I think. I don't know. <laughs> that might not be a good thing. All right. What's, yeah. the, what's the punch list on the building? Is it still kind of key? <laughs> I was asking about the punch list on the building and how lengthy or what's still going on. Yeah, it's shrinking each day. <laughs> How's that? Um, no, it, it actually really is getting smaller. Um, we do have um, some negotiating left to do with the city of San Francisco um, around the work on Geneva Avenue. Um, and trees right now. Those are our big hurdles. Um, but for the most part, um, yeah, we're, on, we're pretty much almost done. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. Other questions? Okay. So here's our homepage, as I think you recognize. And when you go to About, there is a whole <coughs> section on strategic planning, right? So if you want to know about our last strategic plan, you go to past strategic plan. I would recommend that you download and read the strategic plan update, which is facts and figures of all the different goals from the strategic plan. And um, there's some other, you know, here's the full plan. So, but if you're interested in the process and how we're launching this year, this strategic plan, this is your, your homepage. And with that, I turn it over to Tricia. So thank you so much for listening and for your presence. I'm a parent of three alumni children. Um, it's my sixth year on the board, and I'm chairing strategic plan just to end my commitment with a day. So um, Eric referenced community input, so I wanted to kind of describe the context in which you're participating in this activity tonight. and. Um, a little bit about what other ways we get um, are, are getting input from the various constituencies at LIC. So there are three primary methods that we're using to gain inside perspective from students, teachers, 
um, administrators, parents, and in some cases a lot. And the first is really direct conversations. So we've been doing that with amongst trustees this fall, and now with you all. Um, then we are we're getting your direct input and conversations. Um, we'll also be doing it with uh, a, a board visiting day, which is faculty and staff meeting with board members in February, and then with students in February, March. We hope that we'll have an opportunity to circle back with you in the later spring to kind of update you. Um, hoping that you'd be interested. And so that's really one, one method, which is direct conversation, focus groups, meetings, you'll see the variety. The second is really the participation of active committee members. So um, Teresa introduced you to some of them at the beginning, and you'll see, if you can read it here, that it's a pretty diverse group of people who are on the strategic planning committee. So um, five faculty and, can everybody read? Five faculty, fact staff, admin members, um, and eight board members, and that's a mix of parents, <coughs> parents of alumni, alumni, um, and um, educator, outside educator. So that's really who's on that. So we're really trying to cover our bases in terms of perspectives within the committee itself. And finally, the, we've done a lot of work this fall on um, really looking at uh, data, both the school's data, but outside information um, to help put the strategic plan in kind of current perspective, right? in the light of, of um, today, as opposed to five years ago when the last one was done. So just a couple things about what we've been looking at. So um, this is the process that we're using. It's a uh, derivation of the NAIS process, which is National Association of Independent Schools. Um, we are, just so you know, right about here tonight. Um, and we started our process looking at data about the country and how social, <coughs> demographic, economic, political changes are um, affecting kids in independent schools, both now <coughs> but also thinking about the world of work. So we spent quite a bit of time looking at the future of work as well. So we've looked outside the school. We've also <coughs> looked at surveys and data that come from um, sources where Lick is one of the community. So the AIM study. Um, and what else did we look at like that? Um, CIS dashboard. Um, the metro study that used will, will be one of the studies that we look at. So a number of, of data sources where LIC was one of the people, one of the organizations that we looked at. And then finally, um, the perception and satisfaction survey that many of you have probably completed. It's a family survey. And the student experience survey. So those are also all things that we as a committee have looked at pretty exhaustively to try to think about what are the issues that the school should be looking at coming up. Um, and so you will um, be able to sort of weigh in on those, those three buckets of topics or issues that we're looking at. Um, they are recruitment and retention of faculty and staff, um, the, our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and flex tuition, and um, what we're calling Head Hard Hands 2.0, which is really educating the whole child for the future. Those are really kind of the three areas. They're very big. What you see in a published document next fall, which is when you'll see the final plan and it'll be communicated, um, the final plan, the, the plan as it's evolved, it's probably better. But, um, you know, will sound different. There will be, some things will have been called out, some things will have been moved forward, made more prominent, but you get the idea of the things that we're working on. So we're going to ask you two questions about each of those topics. I'm going to read a statement first, sorry. We'll, we'll read a statement to you in, in a small group about the topic, kind of where we, a snapshot of what we're thinking right now. Then we'll ask you two questions about each topic. If all goes well, you'll get to weigh in on each topic. Um, there'll be two tables per topic. So, if that all makes sense. So we need like five minutes to kind of reorganize the room really fast so that you can sit down at a table, and then we'll let you know when time is almost up in each, and you'll rotate to a new table. You don't have to rotate as a group, you can rotate as an individual. Go for the topics that are most important to you in case we don't need to all agree. 